Greetings. Welcome to your education. Can you hear me? This adjustment. Greetings, uh, fellow technologically enhanced primates. Uh, you can see one technological enhancement here that I enjoy that I'm not going to talk too much about, but which it really is a part of uh, the whole vision I'm trying to offer you. And the vision that I'm trying to offer you isn't the vision of any particular thing, but the vision of all things knitted and structured together. This is a, a beautiful quote from uh, the late astronomer Carl Sagan. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that, of which it's made, but the way those atoms are put together. And uh, it's interesting, apropos our uh, talks this morning and the short video we just saw, that there really isn't a word that we have for the way those atoms are put together. And today what I'm going to do with you in a kind of collective enterprise of first-person science, we're going to experiment with a word to think about how we might have more and better and more frequent and intensive access to the way it's all put together. So our first word is really scale. Now, uh, in a certain way, everything in the cosmos is trying to be one. This is uh, evident enough if you go to Beaver Stadium on a Saturday, in which the way in which everything is attempting to be one is by sacrificing the other team with as great alacrity as possible. Uh, now, there are other ways, of course, of uh, the universe trying to be one. Globalization is one on our planet. The incessant texting of each other is another way. But what all of these attempts to be one point to is the necessity of thinking through this word scale. So the title of my talk is Scaling the Noosphere, and it's exactly what we're going to try to do today. Now, if everything is trying to be one, scale should fulfill that criteria, right? So scale has at least three different meanings that I want to amplify for you today. The first one may be the le least kind of recognizable to you, and it's just this idea, excuse me while I rescale, it's just this idea of climbing, right? One scales a peak, one climbs a series of uh, steps. And if we're all collectively or individually going to reach the noosphere, we have to scale it. We have to climb. It's something we have to do. It's not something that can be done for you. It's not something that an iPhone app can do for you. It's something that has to happen from the inside out. Now, there's another sense of scale, of course. This is a radically sped up version of the Eames Brothers uh, Power of Ten video. Maybe some of you have seen it before. And that sense of scale is the sense in which the measure by which we frame our everyday experience. If we scale our interactions towards our family and friends, or we scale our interactions towards ourselves, or we scale our interactions to the cosmos, each of them has a different effect on us and on each other. So that second sense of scale is absolutely important. The third sense of scale that I hope we'll get a little bit more of, the third sense of scale that I think it's also crucial is this word that is quite common in technological circles, which is the need to scale things up. And if there's ever been a time in which we need to scale up our experience of the noosphere, it's right now. Now, uh, I first learned about TED uh, <clears throat> one day when somebody sent me the fabulous video by Jill Bolt Taylor. And even if you haven't seen the video, uh, you'll see it after mine, so I get to sort of piggyback there. One of the most remarkable points of it, of course, is when, uh, excuse me, primate alert. All right. One of the most beautiful moments of it is when she just carries this brain out and presents it to her. Of course, she is a brain carrying a brain out to show you, but there's something unmistakable, some unmistakable demonstrative proof involved when she's carrying this big wad of flesh right in front of her. And what Jill Bolt Taylor uh, proceeds to teach us is that this wad of flesh has at least two aspects, the left brain and the right brain. And we have all been living in this epoch of the left brain. Now, one day, Jill Bolt Taylor was lucky enough, cursed enough to have a stroke. But while she was having that stroke, she thought to herself, wow, I'm a neuroscientist. How many neuroscientists get the chance to study their own brains from the inside out? And my answer to you today is, is the good news is all of us has that opportunity. We're doing nothing but studying our own brains from the inside out at all times. And so in order to have this experience that Jill Bolt Taylor had, you don't have to have a stroke. Jill Bolt <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to have a stroke again, you know. Uh, 
Now, now Jill Bolt Taylor did, but she also had an incredible experience of her under continuity with all things. She experienced the fact that her usual model of herself, to use Bruce Schneier's term from this morning, her usual model of herself as an inside, right, and an outside and a larger cosmos was false. That it was really the case that she was continuous with all things. Now, of course, these are different scales. On one, set, on one scale, it's important to keep the inside inside and the outside outside. But on a larger scale, that scale that was discussed by Nina Yablonsky this morning, that of the entirety of the ecosystem and the human species that lives within it, that scale uh, is not necessarily the most accurate one. So scales, I think by now you see is really the point. And one of the ways I want you to try to scale up your thinking of who you are and what your mind is, is in order to introduce this idea of the noosphere. Now, the noosphere is a concept or a model that I'm trying to offer you right now for a very important reason. Why, why noosphere now? Herbert Simon was an incredibly prescient thinker who was, a, it's really appropriate to bring up at a TED talk because his uh, expertise and discipline spanned many different uh, areas of knowledge. And when he said, and I think this was in the late 1950s, what information consumes is the attention of its recipients, Herbert Simon. Now, all of us probably know that we're at, at a unique moment right now in human technological evolution, right? Something very deep and big is happening on the surface of this planet. And what that, and it's not just Twitter, right? Tw tw Twitter, Twitter is a manifestation of this uh, enormous and difficult to figure out happening. And there was a study at UC Berkeley starting in the year 2000, which I think gives us a little bit of a purchase on what that moment in technological evolution is. Um, there were some very interesting people at the School of Business at Berkeley, and they said, hey, you know, everybody's using this term information this, information that, information highway, information economy. What the heck is information? How much is there of it in the world? And so they did a study. Now in my dictionary, the devil's dictionary, a study is something that you argue with, but nonetheless, right now, I want you to hear what this study came up with. While they were doing the study, where they were making various heuristic assumptions about the quantity of information that's been produced on this planet, they determined that in the first 800,000 years or so of the planet, human culture produced, now I'm making up a number, 12 exabytes or 12 terabytes of information, an enormous quantity of information. Let's talk less about data and visualize the sense of the entire Earth as an iPod, okay? with all of those songs on the earth uh, 12 times over. Between 2000 and 2001 and a half, human culture doubled that amount of information that it produces, right? So we all feel that. We all feel the arrival of the massive spam that has arrived uh, in our ecosystem. And that's presenting all kinds of opportunities. TED is one such opportunity. TED is part of the InfoQuake. It's also presenting challenges. We have to figure out how to organize and model all that information into a larger scale structure that we can make sense of. In short, we have lots of information, but very li little meaning. It's this concept of the noosphere that I hope helps us give, give us a little bit of meaning. Now, what is the noosphere? I keep saying it over and over as if that's going to communicate to you what it is. Well, let me tell a little story about the noosphere. Edgar Mitchell, who was an astronaut on Apollo 14, was coming back from his mission. Now, as you probably know, these Apollo missions were way more scripted even than a TED event, okay? So everything that you did was one after another, and you didn't even have time to think about it. But on the way home, he was done with his entire mission, and he looked out the window, and he saw something like that. And what he saw ex changed his experience as much as Jill Bolt Taylor's stroke changed her experience. He saw the unity that was the cosmos. He experienced the unity that was the cosmos. Now, some of his friends, of course, you know, didn't quite understand what he was talking about, so he had to found an institute that he's been working at for the rest of his life to try to explicate that. Nonetheless, Noah's fear was not made up by Edgar Mitchell. He didn't know the term at the time, I don't believe. So, who made up the term Noah's fear? Very interesting question, right? Our usual model would suggest that some individual person needs to come up with something, right? But there was a very interesting moment in the 19-teens, uh, early 1920s, 
when three separate people seem to have invented the term noosphere at the same time. The first was Vladimir Vernadsky, a Soviet biologist. The second was a man named Emmanuel Leroy, who was a theologian at uh, the Sorbonne in Paris. And the third was Teilhard de Jardin, who was a French theologian also. So two theologians and a scientist. So that sounds like the beginning of a bar, of a bar joke, doesn't it? Two theologians and a scientist walk into the bar and they say, what do you have? I'll say, two noospheres and one nothing. Um, because Teilhard didn't drink, I don't think. So um, anyway, the, 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 uh, Bernatsky's story is the most convenient one to tell. He was experiencing the horror that was World War I. And he was watching some rail cars go by. And it occurred to him that as a geochemist, as a, geo, as a planetary scientist, he didn't have an answer to what was making those rail cars go. Let me explain. In other words, he saw the rail cars going and he knew full well that the locomotive was pulling them or that the coal that was being burned in the locomotive was the cause of the pull. But he realized that there was another order of abstraction that he needed to think in. And that order of, of abstraction was the noosphere. Vernadsky determined that it was the collective attention of human beings on the planet that was moving those rail cars. The feedback loop between what we think and what happens on the planet. So the noosphere names the biological reality of our thought, right? Not only that our thought is caused by biological interactions, but that our thought and our collective attention feed back onto our ecosystem as we're seeing so clearly today. The feedback loop between our own consciousness and what we imagine to be true and the reality of the ecosystem. So noosphere is the collective human attention of all of the semiotic actors on the planet. You might say, why is he saying semiotic actors? Is that some sort of professor jargon? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> and it allows me to introduce the idea that it's not just human beings who are participating in the noosphere. Okay? Bacteria have been swapping d DNA with each other for 3.7 billion years. Flowers have been attracting the attention of insects in order to outsource their reproduction, like very clever frat boys, for 750 million years. <laughs> And, and so the ecosystem swarms with this management of attention, and yet our models don't support it, right? We don't think in those terms. So what I want you to ask you to do today, after you watch Joe Bolt Taylor's talk, and after you leave, is to insert this term noosphere into your vocabulary, and to do it along with another little internal mind hack, because that's what we're talking about, is mind hacking, is to treat the word mind as a verb to observe your own mind and to notice that it is a verb. Now you might say, that sounds like a really strange thing to do. But here we are at Penn State, and all I'm really asking you all to do is to be William Penn reenactors. That's right, because William Penn in his childhood had an experience that we have, would have to classify as a rhetorician as an experience of the noosphere. He had an sim experience very similar to Jill Bolt Taylor's. And he did so simply through an act of introspection, focused, disciplined stilling of his mind. And we can do that with language. Now, there's some big debates going on right now in, uh, in linguistics about some people, the paraha, who don't have a word for one. They have a word for little bit, right? It's probably the case that they assume or presuppose the existence of the one. But we're sort of on the other end of the spectrum. We forget about the existence of the one. And just as the paraha don't have a, a concept of one because they don't have a word for it, I would suggest that we don't have a concept of a noosphere because we haven't been using a word for it. Now, this is a Sierpinski triangle fractal. And when you're doing that mind hacking, imagine yourself as one of those little triangles and the collective of the noosphere as, those bigger, as the bigger triangle. There's Jill Belt Taylor again. Can't get enough of her. This is Norman Pandoro, a, a shaman in uh, Peru who introduced me to uh, the experience of the uh, noosphere. Now, after we do our, after we do our William Penn uh, reenactment, you might say, this sounds all very uh, sort of selfish. You want to experience your inner unity with all things. But what we find is, is that when we experience that inner unity with all things, we want to bring it out into the world. We want to do things like spread nanofiltration water to the one billion uh, people on the planet that don't have any water. 
or electricity made through uh, nanotechnologically enabled photovoltaics for the two billion people on our planet that don't have electricity. And we want to get each other's attention on this project, just like a peacock gets the attention of the peahen with its feathers. And we want to just say yes to the noosphere. Thank you.